Chapter 20 to 21. After spending the entire day with her, Naruto had decided to visit the local hot springs of the village to relieve himself of the slight soreness he was feeling in his body. It felt like ages since he had been to one. Even though, he was tired, Naruto had a wide smile on his face. He laughed softly on thinking of the fact how she'd made him feel and promised himself he would do everything to keep her safe and happy. As he was walking, he turned right and stumbled onto a kid who was running. Ouch, hey, look where you're going, cried the kid as he massaged his rear. Naruto dumbly looked at the kid to tell him otherwise but stopped when he noticed who it was. The kid had short spiky brown hair, black eyes and a small chip in his tooth. He wore grey pants, yellow shirt and a pale green jacket with a dark green stripe down the middle. He also wore a long blue scarf around his neck. As the kid looked up, his eyes widened when he finally noticed who it was. Naruto simply smirked on seeing the look on Kanoamaru's face. Naruto and Aichan. Where have you been all this time? Kanoamaru jolted up from the ground and went on to hug Naruto tightly. Naruto smiled and patted his head a few times before Kanoamaru let go. Well, I can't really tell you that. Kanoamaru. Village secrets and all, you know. Naruto replied apologetically. Naruto had met Kanoamaru during his time at the academy a couple of times and much to his ire earlier, the kid practically worshipped him. However, thinking about it now only made him chuckle. Maybe now you can teach me some cool jutsus. You did say once I'm in the academy, you'll teach me. Kanoamaru stated ecstatically. How about some time later? I'm really tired today and was on my way to the hot springs. I will come to your compound when I'm free and then we'll see what I can teach you, alright? Naruto asked as he bent down to Kanoamaru's eye level. Though slightly disheartened, Kanoamaru instantly nodded to the proposal and ran along to meet his friends. Yet again, Naruto found himself to be looking at the kid's retreating form with a kind smile. The Sandame Hokage had died sealing the Kyubi within him and had protected the village from a great disaster. It was because of the Sandame that he had a parent still alive. He'd be damned if he couldn't at least look after Kanoamaru from time to time. Turning back, Naruto once again made his way towards the hot springs. About 10 minutes later, Naruto reached his destination and after checking in with the receptionist, he proceeded towards the men's changing room. Once he had removed his clothes and placed it in an allotted place, he walked outside with a towel wrapped around his waist. He was momentarily surprised to see two more people in the pool. Great, just when I thought, I'd be alone. Naruto thought. Since he could only see their backs from his position, Naruto couldn't really determine who the two people were. As he walked closer, the two people in the pool turned around on hearing the footsteps and they too were surprised. Shikamaru. Choji. Naruto asked in surprise. He certainly wasn't expecting to meet them here. Oh, Naruto. It sure has been long. Choji said with a wave. Naruto chuckled on seeing a packet of chips beside Choji by the edge of pool. Yeah, it has been. Naruto replied quietly as he dipped himself in the warm water beside his two childhood friends. His body immediately felt highly relaxed upon feeling the warmth of the water and Naruto released a content sigh. I heard, you are a jounin now. Must be a lot of work huh? Shikamaru questioned. He laid back more comfortably and gazed up at the reddish sky. This moment was sure relaxing, and he wished he could just spend the rest of his days like this. Alas, he knew for a shinobi, it was only a dream. Naruto hesitated a little for a few seconds but relaxed on seeing the look on their faces. And to his surprise, they did not appear to be mad at him. Yeah, it sure is, the worst thing about it is the paperwork. Since, I'm not ready to be a sensei yet, I have to handle a lot of paperwork in the office. Naruto replied. He laughed when he heard Shikamaru groan. Still the same lazy person, are you? Working in the office is just a drag. You just sit in a chair all day signing away at the papers. Shikamaru said. Naruto merely laughed at that comment. Shikamaru hadn't changed one bit. Even during the academy, he used to sleep through pretty much all the class. But Naruto knew his mind was most likely more intuitive than his own. So, what are you guys up to? I know Choji, you and Ino are in the same team. How's that working out? Naruto questioned casually as he lowered himself into the water up to his chin. Asuma-sensei has been making us work really hard. It's hard to keep up at times. Choji replied with a slightly down tone. The past two weeks, Asuma had been grinding Team 10 in Taijutsu and correcting their stance along with their teamwork. 
The Nara, Yamenka, and Akimichi clan have been really close to each other since the village was formed and the legends of these three clans' teamwork was known throughout the shinobi world. And Choji really wished he could keep up with Shikamaru and Ino, but he did not wish to fight against his own teammates. Hence, most of the days he would end up standing aside while Shikamaru and Ino had taijutsu spars. Naruto sensed the hesitation in Choji's voice and smiled slightly on remembering his kind nature. He could feel that Choji had certainly become stronger than before, but he was still afraid of hurting others with his strength. There's no need to worry Choji. I'm sure a time will come when you'll use your strength to protect your friends and the village against enemies. What's important is that you use your power for the right reasons. Having a kind attitude is not weakness, you can turn it into a greater strength if you wish. Naruto stated earnestly. Choji widened his eyes slightly on hearing those words. He had once heard his sensei talk to his father about his unwillingness to participate in taijutsu spars and how he may not make it as a shinobi if he kept his kind attitude. But hearing Naruto's words made him believe in himself a little more. While Shikamaru hadn't showed any outward reaction, he too was surprised by Naruto's words. He knew what Choji was going through and even though he had spoken to him on many occasions, Choji was yet to come out his shell. Shikamaru had heard of the blonde's exploits in Takigekir from his father and couldn't even begin to understand the experiences Naruto had gone through. But he was glad that Naruto hadn't completely changed compared to his younger self. Naruto's ability to inspire people had always been one of the characteristics he admired. The three of them became quiet for a while as each of them enjoyed the feeling of the warm water. You should come with us to the barbecue shop sometime. We all meet there once a week for dinner. Plus, I'm sure Kiba, Shino and Ino want to meet you too. It has been a long time after all. Shikamaru spoke to lighten the mood a little. Choji immediately perked up on hearing the word barbecue and a bit of drool formed on his face, much to Naruto and Shikamaru's amusement. Hinata-chan told me about that. I will definitely come the next time you guys meet up. I still haven't met Ino, Kiba, or Shino. I wonder how much Kiba has changed. The guy was always ready to get into a fight. Naruto replied with a bit of nostalgia. He stretched his arms and legs and let out a breath, he didn't realize he was holding. Staring up at the sky, he suddenly found himself amazed by the different clouds. For a mere moment, he could understand why Shikamaru always loved cloud watching. He could certainly get used to this feeling. Yeah, you should. Ino had been asking so many questions about you, it was almost impossible to make her quiet when she learned that you came back. Choji replied taking out a few chips from the packet beside him. Naruto's interest peaked on hearing that. He certainly did not expect Ino to be so interested in him. But he shook his head and chuckled, realizing that the girl had always been too bold in her approach towards boys. So, are you and Hinata dating finally? Shikamaru asked out of the blue. Naruto almost choked as some of the water went into his mouth on hearing that question. He coughed a bit to regain his composure and turned towards the Nara who had smirk on his face. Even Choji was amused on seeing Naruto's reaction. WH, why would you ask that? Naruto stuttered as he lowered himself further in the water. Oh, come on, it was obvious Hinata liked you. Even back in the academy, you guys were pretty close. Shikamaru replied with an amused look. Really? Asked Naruto quite shyly. Nah, Ino wouldn't stop talking about how you and Hinata were perfect for each other. I felt like clawing my ears off on hearing her talk. Shikamaru said with an irked look on his face. Yeah, she talks about a lot of different stuff. Once she starts, it's hard to stop her. Choji added while munching on his chips with enthusiasm. Naruto felt slightly shy on knowing that people had already figured it out, but then he also realized that everyone would come to know about it eventually anyway. So, there wasn't any harm in telling people that Hinata was his girl. Huh, that actually sounds good. Naruto thought with a chuckle. Yeah, Hinata and I are dating. Naruto said quietly. But Shikamaru's and Choji's sharp ears clearly picked up Naruto's words. They both stared at him for a few seconds before looking the other way. That, nice. I'm happy for you. Shikamaru replied genuinely. And Naruto was glad to hear that response and could sense that the two were earnest in their feelings. About 10 minutes later, Choji and Shikamaru got out of the pool and bid farewell to the blonde. They had already been sitting at the pool for about an hour before Naruto had joined them. Naruto closed his eyes and rested his head against the pool side as he finally had some alone time. Yet again, he breathed a sigh of relief as he felt a lot more relaxed than before. 
He hadn't realized exactly how tired he was until he had entered the pool and could already feel his sore muscles loosening up. However, he was surprised when he suddenly found himself standing in his mindscape before Kurama. What happened Kurama? Why'd you call me here? Naruto asked with a confused look. He was slightly taken aback with the disturbed look on Kurama's face. I just felt Nibi's chakra disappear. It's as if she was sealed into something. Kurama stated with a serious voice. What do you mean as if she was sealed? You mean into another Jinchuriki? But I thought she was sealed into one already. Naruto questioned perplexedly. No, not in another Jinchuriki. If that was case, I would have been able to still sense her chakra. But, right now I can't anymore. Kurama said. Naruto's eyes widened on hearing that, but he was also confused. How would that be even possible? He knew all the bijus could sense each other, no matter how far apart they were. So, for Kurama to not being able to sense the Nibi anymore was a worrisome matter. Even Kurama for that matter was confused. While he was aware of one possible scenario where that could happen, but it wouldn't be possible unless there was another Rinnegan user. No that's not possible. Rikudo Gigi and Naruto are the only ones who have ever awakened the Rinnegan through natural means. And Naruto doesn't even know about the Ghetto Mazo yet. Kurama thought. It was true that none of the bijus were close to each other ever since the humans began enslaving them for their own purposes, but it didn't mean that Kurama didn't know the pain each biju went through. The humans had never been kind to the bijus. I'll ask Jiraiya-sensei about it. Considering his spy network, it's possible he'll hear about this news sooner or later. But, right now, I don't think I can do anything about it. We'll just have to wait and be patient about it. Naruto replied. You have to be careful. No one knows what happened with the Yanbi or Gobi up to this date too. They suddenly disappeared two years ago. And now, with Nibi most likely sealed, you can't rule out the possibility that someone is going after the Jinchuriki for the sole purpose of collecting the Bijou. Kurama said on a serious note. I'll look into it Kurama. Maybe it has something to do with that new group that Jiraiya-sensei told me about. And, Kumogakure is going to keep this matter hushed. They wouldn't want the other villagers to capitalize on any sort of weakness. Naruto replied and got out of his mindscape as he opened his eyes. This was certainly a worrisome matter. Anyone powerful enough to steal a bijou from Kumogakure could not be taken lightly. However, what confused him was, what could the bijou have been sealed into? Since all the nine bijou were once part of one being, they all share a much deeper connection than a human's comprehension. For a moment he wondered if he was missing something or if Kurama wasn't telling him the entire truth. He shook his head at that thought. His friend would never hide something from him. Seeing that the sun had already set, Naruto got up from the pool and headed for the changing room. Once he was dressed, he waved goodbye to the receptionist and shunshined out of the area to his home all the while unaware of the slight saddened expression on Kurama's face. It is not my wish to hide things from you, but there are certain things which should remain in the shadows for all eternity. Kurama thought as he rested his head on his paws. Few days later. About three days had gone by since Naruto had learned that someone was targeting the Jinchuriki for their bijou. He still couldn't figure out for what purpose or what means was used to seal the bijou that would leave no trace of their chakra. He had already contacted Jiraiya through the Toad summons and was relieved to know that the Sanmin would be returning to Kanoha in a couple of weeks. Another matter which he wanted to discuss with Jiraiya was about his Rinnegan. Since the man has been traveling around the elemental nations for a good part of his life, maybe he would have come across some information regarding the Rikudo Sanmin. It had been almost four years since he awakened the Rinnegan, but there was still so much about his Jujitsu that he didn't know. Naruto figured if he could learn more about the sage, maybe he could decipher something from that information regarding his eyes. Sadly, Kurama didn't have much knowledge about the Rinnegan, apart from the fact that the sage had used his eyes to separate the Jubi into the nine-tailed beasts. As he leisurely walked towards the Hokage building, he sighed since there was still so much, he didn't know about his own powers. Team 7 and Kakashi were currently waiting outside the Hokage's office for Naruto to arrive. The three genins were all dressed in their shinobi gear and had packed for a mission that may last up to a week. Early this morning, Kakashi had informed them that they would be assigned a C-rank mission today which had excited them greatly. Kakashi-sensei, your habit is rubbing off on Naruto. Sakura stated impatiently. Hey! Hey! Don't blame this on me. Naruto hardly listens to a word I say. Plus, I'm sure he has a good reason for not being on time. Kakashi replied nonchalantly. 
Sakura's eyebrow twitched a little at how easygoing their sensei and Naruto were. They were jounin for God's sake. They should be more punctual right? Hinata giggled a little on seeing Sakura's expression. She had always been the one to lose her cool first. A few minutes later, Naruto finally graced the three genins with his presence. But he had to immediately duck under a punch that was thrown by Sakura. Oi! What's the big deal? Naruto questioned, as he backed away a little. We have been waiting here for half an hour. Do you ever check the time? Sakura asked as she tapped her foot on the floor. Naruto dumbly looked at Sakura and then at Kakashi for some help but sighed when he heard Kakashi snicker behind his book. Damn pervert. Naruto thought irritatingly. You shouldn't be late for our first mission, Naruto-kun. What took you so long anyway? Hinata also questioned, as she stepped beside the pink-haired girl. Naruto felt a little cornered upon such questioning and scratched the back of his head awkwardly. Uh, um, you see. Naruto fumbled forming a coherent sentence but was saved when he heard his two san calling from the office. He immediately moved for the door and entered the office before any further questioning. The two girls smirked and laughed at his antics and Team 7 then followed the blonde into the office. Hinata proceeded to stand a little close to Naruto while, Sasuke and Sakura were beside Kakashi. Minato glanced towards Naruto and laughed inwardly. He had heard the entire conversation outside the office and found it amusing that his son was cornered in a such a way. So, I have your C-rank mission ready. The details are written in this dossier which you people can go through later. For now, I will just give the gist of the mission. Minato stated as he called in his assistant to bring a person by the name of Tizuna. A few minutes later, the doors opened and an old man with a grey beard and a pointed hat on his head walked into the room. From the smell of it, everyone in the room could tell that the man was a heavy drinker. This is Tizuna-san, and your mission is to accompany him to Nami no Kuni and assure his safety. There is a possibility that he may get targeted by some bandits or shinobi on the way. The mission will most likely be a week to ten days long. So, I hope all of you are adequately stacked. Minato asked as he turned towards the three genins. Hi, Hokage-sama. Sakura and Hinata replied while Sasuke merely nodded. Are you sure they'll be able to protect me? These girls look pretty weak, in my opinion. Tizuna commented as he took a swig of a bottle he took out from his bag. Hinata clenched her fists on hearing that and was about to give that man a piece of her mind when Naruto held her wrists. He glanced towards her and shook his head slightly. Tizuna-san, is it? Naruto asked calmly, turning towards him. Tizuna turned his gaze towards the blonde and grunted in reply. You should be more respectful towards the shinobi who'll be protecting you. I heard Nami no Kuni is not doing so well. It'd be a shame if something were to happen to you on the way there and your land would be left without any help. Naruto said, looking straight into the old man's eyes. Tizuna gulped a little on hearing the looming threat and immediately straightened up. Sasuke and Sakura smirked on seeing Tizuna's face lose all color. It's not good to threaten our clients, Naruto. Be on your best behavior. Minato stated firmly, but Naruto clearly felt his father's playfulness from where he stood. Kakashi, Naruto stay behind for a few minutes. Team 7 will accompany Tizuna-san to the main gate and shall wait for you too. Hinata softly nudged Naruto on her way out and gave him a sweet smile when the blonde turned around to look at her. As Team 7 left the Hokage's office along with Tizuna, Minato's face suddenly became serious as he looked at Naruto and Kakashi. I assume there's more to this mission than just protecting Tizuna-san. Kakashi asked, placing his book back in his pouch. Even though it was rare, there were times when Kakashi took his job with complete seriousness. You're right. Couple of years ago, a young man by the name of Kaiza had also requested Kanoha for help. I had sent a genin squad and a jounin to accompany Kaiza back to Nami no Kuni, but the mission went awry. Our shinobi never returned to the village and I believe Kaiza may have died along with them. Since then, I had instructed our border patrol shinobi to keep an eye on Nami no Kuni from afar and note down anything suspicious. We didn't have proof of any illicit activities going on in that nation earlier, but over the past two years, we have gathered some facts. Gato Industries had set up their base of headquarters in Nami no Kuni and have been partaking in the black market activities such as slavery, prostitution, and funding resources to shady groups. Minato revealed. How do you know so much about this, Tusan? Kanoha has never had any form of relation with Nami no Kuni and I doubt the Border Patrol were able to gather so much information by themselves. Naruto expressed his thoughts skeptically. Minato hesitated for a moment, 
wondering if he should reveal this to them. Apart from Shikaku, Jiraiya and him, no one knew about this information. I have been making sure Sway keep tabs on our surrounding nations discreetly over the past few years. Ever since Iwagakure began taking over the land surrounding their nations, I wanted to have information on other nations which normally wouldn't be accessible. Currently, he's stationed near the hidden Frost Village, keeping tabs on Kumogakure. Minato stated. And he wasn't surprised to see the shocked looks on both Naruto and Kakashi's faces. But, that's suicide, Tu Chan. If he gets discovered by the enemies, he'll certainly lose his life. Naruto almost yelled, losing his composure. However, Kakashi remained quiet and went over all the information he had analytically. Calm down Naruto. Focus. Shirsue's skill set is well suited for this kind of mission. He's a cut above the others when it comes to infiltration and espionage. Moreover, if you think about a lot of information we have received over the years, it makes sense that this news was hidden from even us. Have you forgotten about the possibility of a mole we discovered during the Uchiha clan's incident? Kakashi said logically. After hearing Kakashi's words, Naruto calmed down a little but was still slightly on edge. He didn't want to lose another close friend of his. Kakashi is right, Naruto. We have been unable to find the mole within our village even to this day. That's why I'm keeping this information under wraps. Over the past two years, Shirsue has traveled into Kiragakure, Sunagakure, borders of Tsuchi no Kuni, Kumogakure, and even Nami no Kuni to gather valuable intel for us. There's only so much Jiraiya-sensei can do. While Jiraiya-sensei keeps track on Orochimaru and Danzo's movements, Shirsue reduces his workload by keeping tabs on other nations. And even though, Sunagakure is our ally right now, we can't take our alliance too seriously. Few years back, the daimyo of Kaze no Kuni was hiring Konoha Shinobi for our lower prices and because of that less missions were being handed out to Sunagakure which created a slight tension between our nations. Luckily, we were able to avoid any confrontation with them when we agreed to give a small percentage of the missions from Kaze no Kuni's daimyo to Sunagakure. Minato explained briefly. Naruto was highly surprised by the political sport between the nations. He never did really care about it all that much in the past, but he realized the value of playing it aptly. But I digress. Currently, you must treat Nami no Kuni as a hostile territory. Gato has been known to hire Shinobi frequently to carry out his underhanded tasks. Kakashi, your mission is to stay with the Genins and protect Izuna at all costs. While, Naruto your mission is to assassinate Gato and destroy his headquarters. I don't care how you do it, but I want the man removed from Nami no Kuni promptly. Tizuna intends to build a bridge that will connect Nami no Kuni to Hai no Kuni. That way the two nations can begin working on trade businesses via land. Since Nami no Kuni is surrounded by ocean on all sides, the main trade route is water, which is overlooked by Gato's underlings. So, you understand the importance of this mission, right? Minato questioned with utmost seriousness. With Gato Industries removed from Nami no Kuni, Minato wished to open business between the Land of Waves and Hidden Leaf. This would not only benefit the civilian populace of Kanahagakure but also the shinobi. Nami no Kuni was renowned for having quite a few skilled weapons craftsmen. Kakashi and Naruto nodded as they understood how important this mission would be for the village. This would also provide the genins of Team 7 to prove their worth in a life-threatening situation. The two Jounin nodded to their leader and shunshined out of the office to regroup with their team and Tizuna. With Team 7 and Tizuna. As Naruto and Kakashi arrived at the main gate, they found the three genins to be talking amongst themselves while Tazuna stood a little further away, sipping away on his sake. It was barely 10 in the morning and the man already finished half a bottle. Oh, Kakashi-sensei, Naruto-kun, you guys are back. What took so long? Hinata asked as she noticed their arrival. Sakura and Sasuke turned too and had the same questioning look on their faces. Miss me already, Hinata-chan. Naruto asked with a flirtatious smirk. Even though, she was a lot more confident than her younger self, Hinata still felt a little shy when Naruto looked at her that way. Regaining her composure immediately, she scoffed mockingly and completely ignored the blonde to look at Kakashi. Naruto's face faulted at Hinata's mean reply or rather lack of it as a sad aura surrounded him. You can be such a baby at times, Naruto-kun. You know what I meant when I asked the question. Hinata replied. Naruto quickly perked up on hearing Hinata's words that made the others look at the blonde quite dumbly. Well, it's not anything that you guys need to concern yourself with too much. But, as Hokage-sama had stated, there is a high possibility that Tizuna-san may be targeted by Shinobi. 
So, you guys need to be on your guard. Kakashi said with his trademark eye smile after witnessing the amusing banter between Hinata and Naruto. Out of all, one could easily say that Sasuke was the most eager one to go on this mission. He would finally be able to test his abilities against actual enemies and find out how much he had progressed over the years. He was hoping they would get stopped by Shinobi on the way. A few moments later, Team 7, Naruto and Tizuna quickly left the village after checking out with the gate guards, Izumo and Kotetsu. It had been about 5 hours since the group had departed Kanoha. Team 7 were traveling in a diamond formation, with Hinata in the front, Sasuke to the right, Sakura to left, Kakashi at the back and Tizuna in the middle. Hinata's Byakugan would aid the group tremendously in scouting out enemies in front of them. Naruto traveled about 200 meters behind the group, to jump in as a surprise, in case the group was attacked by a group of shinobi. The air around them had turned a tad bit misty as they were nearing the shore. Kakashi Sensei, I believe there's a genjutsu place to our right, about a mile ahead of us. It hasn't rained in days, yet, I see a puddle of water on a completely dry land. Hinata informed as she scouted ahead. Sakura and Sasuke perked up on hearing that and kept their senses up, in case of a surprise attack. Let's not alert the enemy. I don't think they're aware of our knowledge of them. So, let's see how it plays out. It was Sasuke who had voiced his thoughts. Kakashi was mildly impressed with his strategy and gave a go-ahead to the plan. What do you mean? Shouldn't you guys be more careful and deal with them beforehand? Tazuna asked grumpily. He wouldn't believe that these kids could protect him until he saw them in action. He wasn't much fond of shinobi since he never had any pleasant experiences with them in the past. Patience, Tazuna-san. We gave you our word that we'll protect you. Just watch. Kakashi replied to ease off the old man's worries. Tazuna gave no outward reaction but decided to take the Jounin's words. Still, he couldn't help but be skeptical, considering what happened with his son-in-law, Kaiza. He could only hope that this time, things turned out to be different. Because of Gato, the people of Nami no Kuni had been living in constant of fear of their life. And things hadn't been easy with his family ever since Kaiza was publicly executed in the middle of their town. As Team 7 passed the puddle of water to their right, two shadows immediately emerged from the water and jumped towards Kakashi with their sharp claw-like gauntlets that were connected to each other through a metal chain. However, before the two could even reach the white-haired Jounin, Sasuke reacted quicker than the two people anticipated. Taking out his katana, Sasuke turned around and cut the metal chain, making the two shinobi jump back with caution. Kakashi, who still had a bored look on his face glanced up from his book and stared at the two shinobi as he recalled their identities. Gozu and Meizu, the demon brothers of Kirigakure. B-rank missing ninjas with chunin level skills. Kakashi stated out loud. By this time, Sasuke, Hinata and Sakura had all lined up in front of Tazuna protectively. While Hinata and Sasuke had settled into their stance to fight the two missing ninjas, Sakura decided to stay beside Tazuna. Kakashi also decided to stay back, wishing to see how his team would play this out. He knew Naruto was sitting on top of a tree behind them, observing the event. Kakashi was sure his team would be able to handle the two of them, well confident in the three genin's abilities. Oh, these Kanoha shinobi seem more skilled Meizu. Gozu stated with a toothy smirk that was mirrored by his brother. You're right. Let's teach these kids a less. Before Meizu could even finish his sentence, Gozu and him had to jump away from their position as Sasuke had swiftly thrown several shuriken aimed at the two brothers' vital locations. Taking advantage of the brothers' disarray as soon they landed on the ground, Hinata and Sasuke raced towards them and engaged the two in taijutsu. Gozu swung his large metallic gauntlet at Hinata, who graciously ducked under it and struck at his tenketsu on his left arm, thereby making it go limp. Gozu cursed his luck at being paired against a Hyuga and jumped back a few feet to gain some distance. But, Hinata quickly followed up and threw two kunai aimed towards his heart. With his free hand, Gozu managed to deflect the kunais but the moment he took his eyes off Hinata, she appeared behind him and this time, struck his chakra points on the legs, effectively disabling him to move as he fell on the ground and cried out in pain. If you don't wish to suffer any more pain, I'd advise you to keep quiet. Hinata stated as she pointed a kunai to Gozu's throat. Gozu glared at the girl before him and tried to move but with his left arm and both his legs limp, he could hardly do anything. As Hinata looked to her left, she was glad that Sasuke had also managed to defeat his opponent quite easily. But, Hinata and Sakura were quite unnerved when Sasuke simply slit Meizu's throat with no regard. Brother! You little punk! Gozu yelled and thrashed in his spot, 
attempting to crawl towards his brother, but Hinata had stopped him in tracks Sasuke scoffed at the pathetic display and simply turned away from him. You didn't have to kill him, Sasuke. You could have just rendered him unconscious. Hinata stated. She wasn't abhorred with what Sasuke had done rather the look on Sasuke's face when he had killed the shinobi. He was an enemy of the village and got the fate that he deserved. Sasuke replied firmly as he sheathed his katana in the scabbard. Few seconds later, Kakashi and Naruto also joined in. While Kakashi went towards Sasuke, Naruto walked straight towards the downed Gozu. Forming a black chakra rod from his left palm, Naruto swiftly ended the man's misery as he implanted the black rod through the Gozu's heart. What? Naruto questioned with a shrug as he turned around to look towards Hinata and Sakura. Sasuke is right. He was an enemy who had every intention of killing you. He just got what he deserved. Naruto said frankly. Hinata was surprised by Naruto and Sasuke's disregard for life. While she knew the two brothers were in no way innocent, but she still couldn't have brought herself to kill someone so easily. Naruto understood Hinata's distress and calmly walked towards her. My hands are already stained with blood, Hinata-chan. I can't even remember how many I've killed. But your hands are still pure. There's no need to sully your own hands. Only do it when it's completely necessary. Naruto said gently, placing a comforting hand on her shoulder. Hinata quietly nodded and calmed herself. She was Kunoichi of Kanoha and had to act like one. I know, Naruto-kun. Still, taking a life is a lot harder than I had imagined. Hinata confessed. Naruto clearly understood her dilemma and couldn't blame her for the nervousness. Sasuke and Sakura, however, were intrigued with the black rod that Naruto had seemingly produced out of thin air but decided to keep their curiosity to themselves for the time being. Well, let's wrap this up and be on our way, yeah? We wouldn't want to stay out here for too long. Kakashi said, as he sealed the two dead bodies inside a scroll. He would need to take Gozu and Meizu's heads to a bounty office to collect the rewards on their head on Kanoha's behalf. Once done, he turned around and noticed the downhearted look on Sakura's face. Are you alright, Sakura? Kakashi asked on seeing how quiet the pink-haired girl had become. Aha. Uh -huh. It's just that until now, killing another shinobi was just a thought in my mind. But, now that I actually saw someone die in front of my eyes, the reality of it feels a lot more different. Sakura said with slightly lowered gaze. Don't worry about it. I hope you don't have to witness a lot of death in your shinobi career, but then again, it's only wishful thinking. You can never truly prepare yourself for this. You just need to get used to it, Sakura. Kakashi replied understandingly. He had killed thousands of people up till now and was given several names like friend killer Kakashi, cold-blooded Kakashi. Only he knew how shallow it made him feel. But, for the sake of his village, he endured it all. Because that's what meant being a shinobi. Hinata and Sakura moved to Tizuna to check if he was okay and Naruto walked towards Sasuke who stood at the side with his hands tucked inside his pockets. You did well, Sasuke and have grown well as a shinobi. Maybe, I could help you out with your Sharingan later on and help you with ninjutsu and kenjutsu too. Naruto offered. These people were hardly worth fighting, but sure, I'll train with you. A little surprised, Sasuke nodded nonetheless. He'd be crazy to refuse to train with him. Some people in the village considered Naruto to be even stronger than the Hokage and Sasuke was certain his own skills would grow by leaps if he trained with Naruto on a daily basis. He smirked inwardly at the thought of taking his revenge on Danzo. A few minutes later, everyone once again started walking towards Nami no Kuni at a brisk pace. They expected to reach Tazuna's house in a couple of hours. About half an hour later, when the group from Kanoha reached the shore, Kakashi and Naruto suddenly stopped when they felt the unnatural mist surrounding them. Even Sakura, Hinata, Sasuke and Tazuna stopped in their tracks as they couldn't even see an inch in front of them. What's going on? Sakura asked quietly. She had noticed the mist that had rolled in around them since their fight with the demon brothers. But, simply discarded it as a natural phenomenon since they were nearing the shore. Similar thoughts were going through other genins and Tazuna's mind. Everyone stay put where you are. This mist isn't natural. There's chakra mixed in this mist. Kakashi stated cautiously. Naruto lowered himself and placed a single finger on the ground. I sense two shinobi. One is in front of us, while the other is to our southeast but still close by. Naruto said as he stood up. Everyone suddenly became alarmed when they felt an unnatural pressure on them. 
The three genins took a few steps back in fear on feeling the killing intent directed at them and Tizuna looked as if he'd fall unconscious any moment. Naruto and Kakashi stepped forward and kept their senses on high alert. The enemy was strong this time. Oh. Now, this is a surprise. For two of Kanoha's famous shinobi to be here. Echoed a voice all around them. Sasuke gripped the hilt of his katana tightly as Hinata and Sakura held on to their kanai. They had never felt such killing intent in their life and all three could feel their hands shake a little. Now, how should I kill all of you? Maybe a stab through the head? Heart? Or maybe I should cut your limbs? Sounds delightful huh? The voice now came from behind them, as the shinobi laughed menacingly. Kakashi and Naruto momentarily glanced towards each other and nodded. Naruto quickly placed his palms together and released a pulse of pressurized wind all around him to get rid of the mist surrounding them. Simultaneously, disappeared from his position and appeared behind Team 7. With the mist gone and the vision around them clear, everyone could now see Kakashi blocking a large sword with a kunai. Zabuza Momochi. Kakashi whispered as his lone eye narrowed at the former Kiri Shinobi. With sheer strength, Kakashi managed to deflect the large sword, much to everyone's surprise. However, the man named Zabuza once again swung his sword with precision, aiming to sever Kakashi's torso. Kakashi shifted to the right slightly and parried the sword and directed it towards the ground. He quickly followed it up by aiming his right hand coated in electricity towards Zabuza's head. With quick reflexes, Zabuza ducked under Kakashi's hand and dissolved into water. He then rose from the water in the ocean and to Tizuna's surprise, stood perfectly balanced. You got some nice moves there, Kakashi. Zabuza chuckled as he rested his sword on his shoulders. He smirked as he could sense the slight tension developing in the genins. But inwardly he was analyzing his chances of getting out on top. He believed he could most likely take Kakashi in a one-on-one -on -one fight, but the blonde kid was a whole different matter. He glanced at the shinobi who was given the moniker of Shiroi Shinigami and noticed that Naruto hadn't moved from his place at all. The tales of the blonde Uchiha had reached even Mizu no Kuni, and in a practical scenario, he would like to avoid fighting Naruto at all costs. Yet, every cell in his body wanted to test the blonde's strength and confirm if the rumors about his battle prowess were indeed true or not. Kakashi jumped in front of his team and lifted his headband, showcasing his fully matured Sharingan. Oh. The Sharingan already? You honor me, Kakashi. Then, I shall also fight with my full strength. Zabuza stated firmly. The genins of Team 7 had their eyes widened on hearing that their sensei had a Sharingan. Out of the three, Sasuke was the most shocked as he wondered just how Kakashi got his hands on a Sharingan or the fact that he never told his team about it. But he kept quiet as he intently focused on the two Jounin-level shinobi fighting before him. Kakashi and Zabuza once again ran at each other, and Zabuza performed a vertical swing. As the large sword came down, Kakashi jumped and aimed a kick to Zabuza's right arm. But the Kiri swordsman easily blocked the kick with his elbow and in a show of impressive strength, pushed Kakashi back. As Kakashi backflipped and landed on the ground, he performed a few hand seals and called, Katan, Kakiryu no Jetsu. A fire emerged all around the white-haired Jounin and took the form of a dragon which then proceeded towards Zabuza with an intimidating look. Not deterred by the Katan Jutsu, Zabuza performed his own set of hand seals. Suetan, Suryudan no Jutsu, the water around Zabuza rose to about 15 feet and took the form of a giant dragon with glowing yellow eyes. As the two opposing Jutsu collided with each other, a natural mist now formed in the area. Kakashi instantly became highly alert of his surroundings as he aware of Zabuza's specialty. Zabuza quickly hid his presence in the mist and moved towards Kakashi's direction. Sensing danger behind him, Kakashi immediately turned around and blocked the giant sword. The two battled in strength for a few seconds but Zabuza soon overpowered Kakashi and cleaved the Jounin in half. To his surprise, Kakashi dissolved into water and the next second, he found a hand covered in sparkling electricity sticking out of his chest. It's over Zabuza. Kakashi whispered behind him. However, Zabuza chuckled and also dissolved into water. Kakashi had to immediately duck down as heard the swishing sound of the sword cutting through the air. He instantly proceeded to jump away, but Zabuza reacted a tad bit quicker and managed to get a small cut on Kakashi's left arm. Instead of following after Kakashi, Zabuza once again jumped towards the ocean. As the mist cleared, Hinata, Sakura and Sasuke were alarmed on seeing Kakashi panting and clutching his left arm. Sasuke began shaking slightly as he once again felt the fear creep up his spine. The same fear he had felt the night his clan was murdered. So, this is how Jounin's fight. 
I'm not even close to their level. If this continues, I may just go crazy this is insane. So much killing intent. Sasuke thought with beads of sweat rolling down his face. He glanced towards Naruto and was surprised that the blonde stood in his place calm as a tree. Yet again, he cursed his own lack of power. He brought a kunai close to his thigh and proceeded to stab himself slightly to divert the sense of fear elsewhere. He gritted his teeth but kept his calm. Hinata and Sakura were not faring any better. Even though they appeared to be relatively calmer on the outside, inwardly they too were quaking in fear. This was the first time they had witnessed two Jounins fight to death. And from the looks of it, Zabuza had the upper hand. Tizuna, however, was having the worst time of all. He was down on the ground and clutched his head in pain. All of this was beginning to get too mortifying for him to bear. As Kakashi regained his bearings, he stood upright and narrowed his eyes towards Sabuza. Having a Taijutsu spar with him wasn't a clever idea since Sabuza clearly had greater strength than him. His only option would be taking him by surprise and use a Raitan Jutsu to counter his Suetan ones. But, before Kakashi could even make a move, another Mizu Bunshin of Zabuza arose from the scattered water behind him and kicked him towards the ocean. Zabuza quickly performed a set of hand seals and as soon as Kakashi neared him, he called out the name of his Jutsu. Suetan, Suiro no Jutsu, and Kakashi was immediately trapped in a sphere of water. A highly alarmed look appeared on Kakashi's face as he struggled to breath or even get out of this jutsu. Zabuza panted a little and breathed a sigh of relief. Well, this one's done. Few more minutes and he'll die in there. Zabuza laughed out loud. The genins hesitantly took a step forward but still apprehensive whether they'd be able to do much if their own sensei couldn't. You kids think, you can take me on. Don't mock me. You'd die instantly. It'd be better if the Shiroi Shinigami fought me himself. Maybe then you'll have a chance." Zabuza taunted. On hearing that, Naruto started chuckling as he stepped forward. Sasuke, Hinata, and Sakura lowered their gaze as they knew, Zabuza was right. Me? And fight you? You're the one who shouldn't make me laugh, Zabuza. A washed-up shinobi like you is not even worth my time. You couldn't kill the Yande Mizukage, what makes you think you'll be able to even lay a hand on me? Naruto stated with his hands folded across his chest. Zabuza gritted his teeth in frustration at the blonde's taunting but kept his cool. Well, why don't you show me then? Zabuza replied confidently. To his surprise, Naruto simply turned around to look at the three genins. As Naruto turned around to look at his teammates, the three genin were surprised at the warm look on Naruto's face. It was very rare to see Naruto give that look. But it also made them feel safe. That look alone told them to go forth and show their powers. It told them to believe in their own strength and that he'd have their back if something went wrong. With newfound confidence, the three genins fearlessly stepped forward. Zabuza laughed at the stupid confidence that three kids were now portraying and decided to see what they were capable of. It was his belief that a person could not consider himself a shinobi unless they had taken a life. And from the fear he had sensed in them earlier, he was sure these green genins would not be able to do much. Oh, how wrong he would turn out to be. Sasuke took out a Fuma Shuriken from his backpack and to Zabuza's surprise performed one-handed seals with his free hand. Coating the Fuma Shuriken with Raitan Chakra, Sasuke threw it towards Zabuza. The Kiri Swordsman was yet again surprised when the single Fuma Shuriken multiplied into four and all of them flew towards him at a fast pace. Creating five Mizu Bunshins, each clone managed to deflect a Fuma Shuriken but for the slight moment he had diverted his gaze from the Genins, Sakura and Hinata had already performed their own set of hand seals. Raitan, Rakurai no Jutsu, Hinata fired small bolts of electricity towards the five clones which were immediately dispelled from the electric shocks. Sakura placed her palms on the water that was on the ground and proceeded to form four small whips of water. The small water whips proceeded to travel through the water on the ground and as soon as they reached the ocean, they instantly increased in size and the four water whips instantly latched onto Zabuza's feet even though he tried jump. He managed to keep his left hand submerged in the water sphere that was holding Kakashi, for a while, but soon one of the water whips that latched onto his foot flung him away. As soon as Zabuza's hand was out, the water sphere surrounding Kakashi dissolved, thereby freeing him. Sasuke, Hinata, and Sakura smiled widely as they were successful in freeing their sensei even though they didn't manage to scratch Zabuza one bit. Naruto also smiled on seeing the teamwork shown by Team 7 and he was certain Kakashi would be proud of what he'd seen. Hmm, they just got lucky. But they do seem to be smart on their feet at least. Zabuza said, as he landed on top of the water. 
Kakashi was relieved to have gotten out of that jutsu. He was struggling to hold his breath and if he had to spend a few more minutes trapped in that sphere, he would have definitely fallen unconscious. You're not fooling anyone Zabuza. You were forced to let go. Kakashi stated as he calmed himself. Opting not to reply, Zabuza started performing a long string of hand seals, which was also mirrored by Kakashi. How is he doing that? He's doing it even faster than me, thought a surprised Zabuza. How? Zabuza started. Can I read your mind? Kakashi finished, making Zabuza's mind stumble. Before Zabuza could even finish the hand seals for his jutsu, Kakashi completed molding the chakra for the jutsu. Suetun, Daibakufu no jutsu, Kakashi said out loud as a huge water cyclone, turned on its side, formed beside him and smashed into Zabuza with great force. Consequently, the Kiri swordsman crashed into the trees on the land and fell unconscious instantly. Kakashi then fell on his knees as he had used quite a lot of chakra in this fight. Much more than he had expected. He covered his Sharingan eye with his forehead protector and proceeded to walk towards his team. The team seven genins promptly walked towards Kakashi on seeing his tired state. They were thoroughly amazed by Kakashi's strength but more intrigued by the fact that he also possessed a Sharingan. Sasuke had decided to question him regarding the eye once they reached Tizuna's home. As Naruto walked towards Zabuza to finish him off, he suddenly stopped in his tracks and looked up see another shinobi sitting on the tree. From the looks of it, he supposed the shinobi was a hunter ninja from Kiri. I thank you, Kanoha shinobi for finishing off Zabuza. I had been tracking him for quite some time. Said the masked shinobi. Naruto was momentarily surprised at the gentle and kind voice but kept his eyes focused on the hunter ninja. By now, the other members of Team 7 had also noticed the masked shinobi and were staring at him with caution. Are you here to take him? asked Naruto. The masked shinobi nodded and jumped off the tree to stand beside Zabuza. He then implanted two senban needles in Zabuza's neck making the other people believe that Zabuza was indeed dead. Though a little suspicious, Naruto decided to give the Kiri shinobi the benefit of the doubt. Since Kirigakure had recently come out of the civil war, it would be natural that the village wished to clean up its mess and gather their precious tools. I wish you luck on your mission, Kanoha shinobi. The hunter ninja said before he picked up Zabuza body and disappeared from the area. Almost immediately, Kakashi fell on the ground as his body was too tired to stand up. Kakashi sensei. What happened? Are you alright? Sakura asked worriedly as she knelt beside him. Tizuna breathed a huge sigh of relief as he saw the danger before them had ended. He was a bit more satisfied than before about the group of people protecting him. But, now that he stared at the blonde kid, he couldn't believe his eyes that he was the shinobi known as the Shiroi Shinigami. He had only heard tales of the man a couple of times from Gato's underlings. The rumors described the Shiroi Shinigami to be a being of pure terror, that anyone who dared oppose him would meet his death ultimately. But the more he stared at the blonde, the more he found those rumors to be unbelievable. These shinobi are freaking crazy. Tizuna thought in disbelief. Turning towards Kakashi and his team, he was surprised that the man could even stand after the fight he had just witnessed. Tizuna-san, how far are we from your house now? Hinata questioned. If we hurry, we can reach in an hour most likely. Kakashi-san can rest in the guest room. I believe he's extremely tired. Tizuna said with a bit of respect. As the group once again began making their way to Tizuna's house, Naruto couldn't help but shake the feeling that they were being watched or followed. It was disturbing because he couldn't feel any chakra signatures close to them. He decided to simply ignore the feeling for now and follow Tizuna. As Naruto and the group went out of sight, the space near the shore distorted into a spiral shape and a pale skinned man with a small gourd strapped to his back stepped out. Oh. I finally found him. The lost prince of our clan, let's see just how good you are with those eyes of yours. The man quietly said to himself as he laughed a little. Tizuna's house, Nami no Kuni. About an hour later, the group from Kanoha had finally reached Tizuna's house. It was a simple two-story house with a porch on the front. The door was opened by a beautiful young lady with long blue-colored hair. She wore a short-sleeved pink shirt and a long blue-colored skirt. Tu San, you're back, exclaimed the lady in delight. From the look Ono her face, it seemed she was quite worried. Yeah, these shinobi from Kanoha escorted me along the way and will be staying with us until I finish building the bridge. Tizuna replied in relief and invited the Kanoha shinobi behind him inside the house. Sakura and Sasuke immediately entered the house to get some much needed rest. 
they were quite winded from the journey and the fight they were involved in. Hinata was about to follow when she saw Naruto stop. Kakashi sensei, I think I will go scout the area just in case. You should go and take some rest. Naruto said. Kakashi understood the meaning behind Naruto's words and simply nodded. Getting himself off Naruto, the white-haired Jounin Wobbly stood on his own leg. Chakra exhaustion is among the worst scenarios a shinobi could suffer from. If not taken caution, one may even perish from the lack of chakra inside the body. Naruto turned around to walk away when he was stopped by Hinata's voice. Where are you going, Naruto-kun? Hinata questioned. Oh, don't worry Hinata-chan. I'm just going to look around for a bit. You guys should go and rest. All of you did some good work and need to recover your strength. I should be back by sunset. Naruto replied with a smile. Hinata eased up a bit on hearing that but still felt as if he was hiding something. Looking into his eyes, she could always say if he was being completely honest or not. But she decided to trust his words. Alright, be sure to come back soon okay? I'm sure Tazuna-san's daughter will have meals prepared for us. Hinata said. Naruto gave a gentle nod and walked in the other direction, towards the town. Hinata then proceeded to help Kakashi walk into the house. With Naruto. As Naruto walked through the middle of the town, he was saddened on seeing the state it was in. It was the middle of the day and there were hardly any people to be seen. A lot of the shops appeared to be broken down with a closed sign outside of it. Some of the shops which were open seemed to be inadequately stacked with products. Based on what he had seen up till now, he could see why the people of Nami no Kuni despised Gato so much. The businessmen had taken away the people's livelihood and terrorized them to an extent that people barely came out of their houses. His ears suddenly picked the sound of few people arguing and when he turned to that direction, he was surprised to see a few thugs holding an old man by his collar. Naruto decided to move closer to the shop, so he could hear what they were arguing about. Your tax was due a week ago, old man. When do you think you're going to pay? scowled the man who was holding the aged man's collar. The thug's two companions were standing behind him with cocky smirks on their faces. Please. Just give me another week. I'm still a little short of the amount. The old man said pleadingly with pure horror on his face. Gato wants the money now, old bastard. You were given enough time. You either pay now or lose your life. The thug stated as he took out a knife from his pocket and pointed it to the old man's neck. A few tears rolled down the old man's face as he shut his eyes in fear. He cried and hoped for someone to come and help him and the thug simply enjoyed the look of terror on the old man's face. He pointed the knife a little closer to the man's neck, drawing a small amount of blood. However, he suddenly stopped when he heard some noises behind him. Turning around, he was surprised to see his two companions down on the ground with their throats slit wide open. He suddenly backed away a little when he felt someone tap his shoulders. Who the hell are you? The thug yelled when he saw a young blonde boy stand beside the old man. No one you need to concern yourself with. So, you work for Gato, huh? Naruto questioned calmly. The thug was yet to notice the Konoha headband on Naruto and raised his voice slightly this time. So, what if I do? You don't want to mess with the boss over here. He'll have you killed in no time. The thug stated quite confidently. He raised his hand holding the knife and pointed it towards Naruto who portrayed a blank face. Before the thug could even blink, he was punched in his gut and flew back, hitting the wall harshly. Naruto walked closer to the fallen man and held him up his shirt. Where is Gato's headquarters? Naruto asked firmly. His rinnegan bore into the man's eyes and the thug found himself hypnotized by that strange eye. It's on the northwestern front of Nami no Kuni. It's surrounded by trees and several missing ninjas for protection. The thug replied fearfully. Without further thought, Naruto took out a kunai and implanted it in the man's head, killing him instantly. He turned around when he heard a gasp. The old man took a few steps back in fear when he saw the young kid kill the man. Naruto's face turned a little soft on seeing that. Civilians were not used to seeing someone get killed and hence it was normal for the old man to have a look of apprehension etched on his face. It's alright. You're safe now. I promise you won't have any troubles from these thugs or Gato any longer. I have been sent by Kanoha to rid Nami no Kuni of Gato and his men. Naruto said kindly. Still a bit in shock, the old man breathed a sigh of relief and thanked the blonde for saving his life. Naruto chuckled awkwardly, not really used to being thanked by civilians. He was just doing the job that was assigned to him. Still, 
he was kind of glad that he could save the old man's life. May I offer you something in return? Some fruits and vegetables. I apologize if I can't give you any money. Gato has imposed taxes on all the people who own shops here. And the taxes are so high, it's hard for us to save anything to support our families. The old man stated with lowered gaze. Naruto placed a comforting hand on the old man's shoulder. No, it's okay. You don't have to worry about anything anymore. Once Gato is gone, Nami no Kuni will be a safe place to live again. Naruto said gently. The old man wiped a few tears off his face and nodded, gratified by the young boy's words. But still I can't let you go empty-handed. You saved my life. I have to give you something in return. The old man insisted and looked around his store. He packed a few fruits and vegetables in a polythene bag and handed it to Naruto. Deciding to just please the old man, Naruto took the bag and sealed it into a scroll as the shopkeeper looked at that in amazement. After bidding farewell to the old man, Naruto left the shop and quickly made his way towards Gato's location. He was about a couple of miles away from Gato's base when Naruto suddenly stopped in his tracks. He had to immediately jump away when he noticed a hook connected to a red chakra wire just grazed past him. As he turned around, Naruto's eyes widened in surprise at the person standing atop the tree branch. He had grayish-blue unkempt, short spiky hair which was kept in a ponytail. He had brown horns that grew from the back of his head and wrapped around to his forehead, with a small gap in between them. He also had typically clipped eyebrows as a symbol of nobility. He wore a long-sleeved, light-colored suits with a sectioned apron over it, along with a sash and carried a small gourd strapped to his back. Nicely dodged, young prince commented the man as he jumped to the ground. Naruto tensed up as he looked at the man before him cautiously. He was definitely an Atsutsuki. And who might you be? Naruto questioned. However, the unknown Atsutsuki swung his chakra rod again. Reacting quickly, Naruto lifted his arm and deflected the hook with a pulse of gravity. He jumped back to gain some distance, in case the man attacked again. Names don't matter at this point. But our clan has been observing this planet for the past millennia. It's a shame that Kagaya had decided to betray us for pitiful creatures such as humans. The man stated, all the while having a prideful smirk on his face. Is this who that man had warned me about? But, it's too soon. I have no information on the Atsutsuki. Naruto thought worriedly. He glanced towards the man before him again and wondered how he could get out of this or if there were other people with him. Quite worried, are you? You're the last remnant of the Atsutsuki clan's main branch on this world. And we can't have any traitors among us. The man said again as he lunged towards Naruto. Quickly forming a black chakra rod from his palm, Naruto also moved towards the Atsutsuki as the two clashed. Putting more force, Naruto managed to push the man back slightly. Freeing one of his hands, Naruto fired few more chakra rods to the man's chest. To the blonde's surprise, Another hook branched off from the man's red chakra rod and deflected the black rods thrown by him. Jumping back, Naruto formed a few hand seals and placed his palms together. Suetun, Swishuha, Naruto said as he created water from thin air to form a tidal wave all around the Atsutsuki. In a matter of second, the water around the unknown man converged on him, hitting him dead on. However, Naruto found himself on the defensive as he saw another hook coming towards him through his Suetun jutsu at lightning fast speed. As Naruto attempted to dodge the attack, the hook seemed to gain more speed and before Naruto could react, the hook had pierced him straight through the chest. Ah! Uh. Naruto groaned as he fell on his knees. That was quite the attack, little on. Let me repay that to you. The man said. Naruto's eyes widened as his own jutsu appeared out of the man's gourd and a large wave of water was now falling towards him. Naruto tried getting the hook off of him, but nothing seemed to work. He closed his eyes and summoned large amounts of chakra. Just as the wave was about to hit Naruto, large amounts of chakra exploded from the blonde to form an ethereal silver-colored warrior holding a scythe, around him. Naruto groggily stood up as the water around him settled on the ground. Summoning all his strength, he managed to take the hook off, but was intrigued when he saw blue-colored chakra surrounding the hook. Before Naruto could realize what had happened, the man retracted the hook. You're a feisty one, aren't you? I can see why my superiors are so interested in you." The man said with a jovial smile, which seemed to confuse Naruto. Narrowing his eyes upon his opponent, Naruto Susano swung the large scythe at him which the man nimbly dodged. After a couple more attempts, Naruto fell on his knees as he coughed some blood from his mouth. 
even his Susanoo had disappeared at this point. What the hell is going on? I can barely stand on my two feet. Karama. Naruto thought as he called to his friend. Karama was now viewing the man before him extreme caution. Naruto, you have to careful of him. What he took right now, was your chakra. And a large amount of it. I will lend you some chakra right now, but make sure you're not hit by that chakra rod of his again. Karama stated seriously. Naruto's body was soon engulfed in a thick red chakra shroud as he felt himself getting rejuvenated. He thanked his friend for the help and stood back up, once again. You're still too weak, young prince. Even though, you have the eyes of our clan, you don't know your own potential. You can't see your own destiny with those eyes of yours. It really is a shame. The man said with a shake of his head. Naruto remained calm as he calculated his chances of getting out of this alive. From the looks of things, the Atsutsuki wasn't even winded and Naruto highly doubted whether the man used even a fraction of his true strength. Kurama, I know we have never done this before. But I need your help right now. If I don't use everything I have, I don't think I can escape this situation. I hope you haven't gotten rusty. Naruto asked his friend with a slight smirk. Hmm. Let's give him all we have. Kurama replied as he sat in a meditative pose and placed his palms together. Large amounts of dense yellow chakra suddenly engulfed Naruto and coated his entire body which emanated from him, reminiscent of flickering flames. Nine Magatama markings now adorned Naruto's back and collar, a sort of circular design featured prominently over his stomach and his whisker-like markings on the face became thicker along with a pattern consisting of Rinnegan-like marking above the Nine Magatama also appeared on his back. With the influence of using Kurama's chakra, Naruto's pupils which were completely dilated now became slit-like, whereas his Rinnegan now appeared to be red in color, his Mangekyo Sharingan remained the same. As the large gist of wind that had appeared around Naruto settled down, the surrounding area appeared to be completely destroyed. Oh, now, that's more like it. Show me what you can do, Naruto Uchiha Namikaze, the man yelled loudly as he prepared himself. As Naruto steadied composed himself, he launched towards the man. Within a flash, Naruto appeared behind the man and went for a jab to his jugular. The Atsutsuki promptly turned around and swatted Naruto's hand, then aimed a punch to Naruto's gut. With lightning-fast reflexes, Naruto caught the man's arm and punched him on his face. The Atsutsuki went flying back with force and hit several trees in the process. Flipping midair, the man regained his footing and blasted off towards Naruto. Naruto swiftly jumped above the man and kicked him in the back but was only able to push him a few feet away. Levitating himself in the air, Naruto pointed both his arms at the man and released a large wave of gravity towards the ground. In a few seconds, the entire ground below the Atsutsuki's feet began to shake violently followed by several trees getting uprooted from their place. The man tried jumping away but the force of gravity kept pushing him towards the ground which was making it harder for him to regain his footing. A deep crater was soon formed spanning about a mile in radius as Naruto ended his jutsu. He was amazed by how much his physical prowess, ninjutsu and speed were amplified when using the chakra cloak. This was his first time using Kurama's power and quite frankly, he never felt more power coursing through his body before. As the Atsutsuki lifted himself from the ground, he dusted his clothing for dust and looked towards the levitating blonde. While he had became familiar with the different bijus that were scattered across this planet, he had never imagined someone to be capable enough to handle such large amounts of chakra so efficiently. He panted a little as he realized that attack had taken quite a toll on his body. He would have to stop underestimating the kid. Placing his palms together, the Atsutsuki molded large amounts of chakra and suddenly two large hands, made of stone rose from the ground and moved towards Naruto to squash him. In response, Naruto formed two large Rasengans in both his hands and aimed it towards the two stone hands that were raining down on him from both sides. As the two Rasengan impacted the stone hands, there was a large blast which caused the debris to fly all around the blonde. He formed a protective sphere of gravity all around him which automatically deflected any large pieces of rocks that came close to him. When he looked down, he was surprised to find the Atsutsuki to be nowhere in sight. His senses suddenly urged him to duck down as the fishing hook grazed the top of his head. He sighed in relief as he turned around to also find the man levitating. What is it that you wish from me? Naruto questioned again with narrowed eyes. The chakra that resides in you. You have the strongest chakra on this planet. All the chakra belongs to the Atsutsuki clan. The man stated as a matter of fact. Naruto prepared himself as he saw the man raise his arm but was confused when the space behind the man distorted to open a portal of sort. Jakuken Ninjutsu. 
Naruto thought. Yurashiki Atsutsuki, remember the name. We shall meet again young prince. I must say, this little skirmish was quite entertaining. The man now identified as Yurashiki said before disappearing from Naruto's view. Once the blonde was sure that the man had gone, he lowered himself onto the ground as his chakra cloak dissipated. He suddenly fell on the ground as he felt the toll of using such large amounts of chakra for the first time. He gasped harshly to regain his breathing. That was the toughest fight he had ever been involved in. But it also gave him an insight into what the Atsutsuki wanted with him in general. A few minutes later, he heard some rattling noise and was surprised to see Kakashi standing beside him. From the worried look on Kakashi's face, it was safe to say that the Jounin had never seen Naruto in such a terrible state. The moment he had felt Naruto's chakra he had rushed to his location. He was further alarmed when he also sensed the Kyuubi's chakra. Up until now, he had never known Naruto to utilize the Bijou's chakra. But it also worried him as to who could have forced someone like Naruto to utilize the Kyuubi's chakra. Looking at all the destruction around him, he was certain about one thing. This enemy would turn out to be a tremendous problem, not only for Konoha but for the entire shinobi world. What happened, Naruto? Who was that person? Kakashi asked, as he picked the blonde up gently. Naruto somberly stared at the sky above him with a defeated look in his eyes. He knew he would have most likely lost the fight, if it had continued for longer. His body wasn't used to handling such copious amounts of chakra all of a sudden. He also realized that the man named Yurashiki was right. He needed to learn more about his own eyes and powers. If what he understood was correct, he wasn't even close to using his entire strength and for some reason it terrified Naruto. He was certain that he'd be able to beat any shinobi if it came to a fight to death normally. But against threats like the Atsutsuki, he was merely a child. Yurashiki Atsutsuki. Naruto said weakly. An extremely surprised look appeared on Kakashi's face on hearing that name. Atsutsuki. As in related to the Rikudo. Kakashi said, barely in a whisper. Naruto nodded his head as he sat up. Even though he wasn't all that injured, it was his muscles that were sore and chakra coils that felt burnt up. Just give me a minute. Naruto said as he sat upright. He was grateful to have learned Senjutsu. His innate ability to harness the nature chakra in the world helped him quite often in tight scenarios. He immediately felt his muscles and chakra coils relax as the healing properties of the nature chakra worked its magic in Naruto. A few minutes later, Naruto stood up looking relatively refreshed from before. But one could still see signs of tiredness on Naruto's face. Yes, you're correct. The man identified himself as Yurashiki Atsutsuki and claimed to be after the chakra that I possess. Naruto revealed. Still confused by the whole ordeal, Kakashi shook his head. All of this was simply too much for him to process at the moment. Let's get back to Tazuna's house. Everyone is worried. We can discuss the rest over there. Kakashi stated. Placing his hand on Naruto's shoulder, the two disappeared in a shunshin. Soon enough, the two were now standing outside Tazuna's house. Naruto was surprised when Hinata immediately tackled him to the ground. Hey, hey, it's fine. I'm okay. Naruto said soothingly on hearing light sobs from her. However, she kept hugging him tightly. A few seconds later, Naruto somehow managed to push her off of him and look her in the eyes. What happened? All of us sensed that large chakra emanating from you. And we were all worried. I wanted to come with Sensei, but... Hinata said haphazardly. Naruto smiled at the worried state she was in. It calmed him to know that she was this worried about him, but at the same time he cursed himself that he had in fact worried her. Holding her by the shoulders, he guided Hinata to stand on her feet. I'm sorry to have worried you Hinata-chan. Naruto apologized genuinely as he hugged her again. He glanced towards Sakura and Sasuke who were standing a few meters behind and nodded to them. They too were worried about Naruto. As they went inside, Kakashi asked Tazuna and Tsunami to excuse them for a while as they discussed the matter inside the guest room they had been given. What was that Naruto? It felt terrifying. Sakura asked with a shudder. She had never felt such potent chakra in her life. And it scared her slightly to imagine how powerful Naruto actually was. While Sasuke too was worried slightly, he was more intrigued by what he had felt. Even though none of them were sensors, they were still able to feel Naruto's chakra. And to be frank, it simply felt otherworldly. What I'm about to tell you is not a myth. Do you guys know about the Rikudo Sanin? Naruto asked with seriousness. 
By now, Hinata had relatively calmed down as she had noticed Naruto wasn't heavily injured. Sasuke and Hinata nodded, having heard of the legendary man in several stories. However, Sakura looked on confusedly at Naruto. I'm not surprised that you don't know Sakura. Rikudo Senin is the man who was claimed to have distributed chakra among the humans and is regarded as the father of ninjutsu. It was Kakashi who stated, to clear up the girl's doubts. A look of amazement suddenly appeared on Sakura's face as she learned that. Rikudo Senin's actual name was Hagoromo Atsutsuki. He belonged to the Atsutsuki clan which is an ancient clan. The clan resides in another dimension of space-time and from what I have learned so far, they are seeking the chakra in this planet. One of them had apprehended me just now in hopes of either capturing me or taking my chakra. I'm not sure cause, the man could have certainly killed me if he wished to. Naruto explained. Everyone in the room were speechless on hearing Naruto's account. All of this just appeared to be highly unbelievable. Are you serious? Sasuke asked in bewilderment. Naruto simply nodded, as he stretched his arms and legs a little. His brother had once told him that the Uchiha clan were direct descendants of the Sage of Six Paths. So, maybe there was some truth to what Naruto was saying. Do you think the man will come again? Hinata asked. I think so. But I believe he was just testing my strength. He may not come anytime soon but he definitely will. And this is something that needs to be notified to all the other nations to Kakashi-sensei. Tu-san needs to be notified about this as soon as we get back. Naruto said, turning towards his sensei at the end. That seems about correct. If there is a looming threat such as this, I don't think our village can handle it alone. But, as it stands now, we'll just have to be careful. Kakashi replied pondering over the matter. They all looked towards the door when they heard a knock and Tsunami entered the room. I hope I'm not disturbing anything. But the food is ready. I'm sure everyone is hungry right now. She said with her kind smile. We'll be out soon, Tsunami-san. I appreciate you telling us. Kakashi replied with a nice smile. Sakura got up and left with Tsunami to help her set up the table. As the two left, Kakashi cleared his throat to gain Naruto's attention. We still need to complete the mission at hand before we do anything about what we talked about. Kakashi replied and Naruto chuckled awkwardly as he had almost forgotten about it. There was so much going in his mind right now, it was hard for him to focus at one thing clearly. Zabuza may still be alive. Sasuke said getting to the task at hand. After Naruto had gone, Kakashi had presented them with that possibility. The shinobi who claimed to a hunter ninja did not follow the proper protocol for disposing a missing ninja and may in fact be an accomplice of Zabuza. Hinata cleared the fact. It is possible. None of us really checked if Zabuza was indeed dead or not. Kakashi added. As Naruto absorbed the information, he concurred with Kakashi's conclusion. His stomach suddenly growled as a silly look appeared on his face. Kakashi and Hinata chuckled on seeing Naruto's face as she scratched the back of his head. Sasuke simply shook his head at that. Anyway, let's go get something to eat before we decide on anything further. Kakashi said. Soon enough, the four of them walked out of the room and they were immediately hit with the delicious smell of freshly cooked food. As they sat on the table, they were surprised by the variety of food that was cooked. There was pork, beef, vegetable stew, fried rice, and even some dessert for the end. Ah, all of this looks so beautiful. Naruto commented with a drool forming on his face. He could probably devour everything on the table but controlled himself to show some decency. Close your damn mouth, a fly might just enter it. Sasuke stated with a smirk. The people from Kanoha suddenly became eerily quiet on hearing Sasuke's words. Did, you just make a joke? Sakura said with disbelief and everyone laughed a little at the little event. Sasuke became a little irked as to how everyone was surprised at him instead. Hinata slightly nudged Naruto to show him some restraint. He would always seem to forget his manners when eating his food. A few minutes later they were joined by a little kid who looked to be about 8 years of age. Without greeting anyone, he simply took his seat and started having his food. Soon enough, everyone became quiet as they savored the delicacy made by Tsunami. Tizuna and Tsunami stole a few glances at the blonde after what they had felt a while ago. They were worried that Gato may have pulled something on learning of their intentions. But, seeing as the Kanoha Shinobi were doing okay, they didn't voice their opinions. Tizuna-san, how long do you think it will take to make the bridge? Sakura questioned to break the sudden silence had reigned over them. Hmm. 
I guess, in a week or so if I work for six or seven hours a day, provided I get help from other people in the town. Tazuna replied. While everyone had a glass of water beside them, Tazuna had his precious bottle of sake. For a moment, Naruto, Kakashi and his team wondered how the man could drink so much without ever falling ill, but none of them said any word. Most of the people are extremely afraid of what Gato might do them. So, a lot of people who had agreed to lend a hand earlier, now backed off. Currently, there are only about four or five people more who still wish to help my father in building the bridge. Tsunami replied sadly. On hearing that, Naruto already had an idea in his mind that would certainly speed up Tazuna's work. I'm sure you wouldn't need to worry about Gato in a few days of time. I saw the state the town was in and it was truly sad. But, rest assured, if Gato sends any more men after your father, we'll protect him. Naruto replied to cheer up the woman. Hinata and Sakura also nodded to show their support. A while ago when Sakura and Hinata were helping Tsunami in cooking food, she had told them about her husband Kaiza who was humiliated in front of the whole town and killed. They were appalled by the injustice Gato had done on this town and wanted to make the man pay. You will just die, why even bother, they all heard the voice and looked towards the kid with surprise. What was that? Sasuke asked rather angrily. I said, you'll just die. If you go up against Gato, he'll just hire stronger shinobi to kill all of you, replied the kid angrily. Tizuna and Tsunami looked at him with sadness in their eyes while the Kanoha shinobi were quite confused with such a reaction. Sasuke was about to retort the kid for babbling such insolence but stopped when he saw Sakura's pleading eyes. He scoffed at the kid and returned to his dinner. Inari, don't say such things. These shinobi have protected your grandfather on the way here. And I'm sure they'll protect him during his work too. Tsunami said to him as she placed a hand on his cheek. However, Inari simply shook off her hand in retaliation. What makes you think we'll die? Do you not hope that things will get better someday? Naruto questioned. He was interested in knowing why the kid had such nihilistic views. Inari stared at the blonde grumpily for a few seconds before he stood up from his chair. There is no such thing as hope. My grandpa told me you're super strong but where were you when my father was killed two years when he asked Kanoha for help? Kanoha wasn't able to do anything then and even now you'll just get killed like the others. Inari ranted. Naruto widened his eyes as he realized who the kid was talking about. He felt saddened at the fact that the kid lost his father at such a young age. But, then again, he did not wish for the kid to have such a bad outlook on the world. There is always hope, Inari. You may not believe it now, but sooner or later you'll see it with your own eyes. There is a lot of darkness in this world and it's true that a lot of people go through some dreadful experiences. I, too have lost several people that were close to me, but I still have hope. I too had almost given up but my friends had made me realize, it's not over until you give up. The moment you lose hope within yourself, is the moment you can no longer step forward. Naruto stated calmly. He could understand the boy's pain and sympathized with him. Just shut up. You're wrong. You're wrong, Inari cried as he ran upstairs, leaving his food cold on the table. Tsunami was about to go after him, when she was stopped by her father. Give him some time. It hasn't been easy on him, or any of us. Tizuna said, and for once everyone could see the tired look on the old bridge builder's face. Someone who was barely hanging on to life. Once again, the living room fell silent. While Tsunami and Tizuna were worried about Inari, the Kanoha shinobi thought about the injustice that Nami no Kuni had been suffering under Gato's rule. Gato's headquarters, later at night. Gato worriedly sat in his chair inside his office with a look of apprehension on his face. Having been associated with Black Market for several years, he had heard the name of Shiroi Shinigami. So, when he had learned from Zabuza that the shinobi himself that come to Nami no Kuni to help that wretched builder, he was concerned about his work in this nation. And from the catastrophe just outside his headquarters his men had told him about a while ago, he was certain it was the work of the Shiroi Shinigami. For a moment, he cursed himself for crossing Kanoha's path. For a while, he had been transporting goods to the group called Akatsuki through Hai no Kuni. He believed TH Hokage would not get wind of his works in the Fire Nation, but now he realized how wrong he was. The Hokage would not send someone like Naruto Namikaze unless he wished to remove him from power. Even though, he had more than hundreds of people working under him as his protection, he knew none of them would last against that man. Even Zabuza was down for a few days, who had fought another Kanoha Jounin. Even though it would cost him millions of money, his only other option was to hire a couple of shinobi from the Akatsuki to take care of the Namikaze. 
it was better to lose some money than his grip on this nation. He was brought out of his thoughts when he heard a knock on his door. Two shinobi dressed in high-collared black robes with red clouds on it, entered the room. The two Akatsuki members stared at the small man for a few seconds before one of them spoke. Do you have the money you promised for this mission? asked Hiroko. What the hell are you talking about? I wouldn't pay now. Once I know that the Kanoha shinobi are dead, only then. Gato stated with a scowl. Kisame chuckled at the man's response and placed his large on the man's desk, cracking it a little. I advise you pay up now. My partner over here will not hesitate in killing you, if you don't, replied Hiroko calmly. Gato took a few steps back in fear at the large man's imposing figure. Debating with himself for a few seconds, he nodded. Opening his drawer, he took out a bag and handed it to the shorter shinobi. Hiroko opened the bag to check its content and once satisfied, he enclosed it within a scroll and put it in his pouch. Rest assured, Shiroi Shinigami will be taken care of. And with that, the two Akatsuki members disappeared from the office without any trace. The two of them then appeared on the battle scene of Naruto and Urashiki, to inspect the area. They were close to the borders of Nami no Kuni when they were contacted by Gato about this matter. Even they had felt Naruto's chakra and were greatly intrigued as to what could have prompted him to use such power. Kisame was practically giddy at the prospect of having to battle his target. He hadn't had a good fight in a long time and he knew for a fact that the Shiroi Shinigami wouldn't disappoint him. Remember Kisame, we are not here to capture the Kyubi Jinchuriki. Leader Sama had warned us we'd most likely lose our life if we were to apprehend him alone. We are just to test his strength and report our findings to Leader Sama. The kid has grown to be overwhelmingly powerful. Hiroko stated. It doesn't matter. I just want to test his strength for my own satisfaction. Anyway, why don't we just kill Gato and be done with him then? He won't be of any use to us. Kisame replied. Considering that Kanoha had sent the Kyubi here, I can only assume it's to assassinate Gato. Let them deal with him. He's no longer our problem. It's interesting that someone out there exists who could push Naruto Namikaze to such levels. I had definitely sensed him using the Kyubi's chakra. This is an intriguing development. Hiroko said, as he looked around. His eyes noticed several black rods on the ground. As he touched one, he immediately jerked his hand off them as he felt foreign chakra enter his body. What the hell was that? Hiroko thought shiftily. He had noticed similar black rods on his leader's face and always wondered as to what they were. Opening an empty scroll from within his pouch, he placed it beside the black rods. Performing a few hand seals, Hiroko sealed a few broken pieces of the black rod for further inspection later. Meanwhile, Kisame looked around at the amount of water still lying around in the area and got further excited at the prospect that the Namikaze might turn out an impeccable Suetan user. He could hardly control himself at this point. Naruto currently sat deep within the forests in a meditative pose, focusing on his chakra. Even though, he had almost perfect control of his chakra, he wasn't entirely satisfied. The way he had observed Urashiki utilize chakra in his fight was on a completely different level. With his Rinnegan, he had observed that Urashiki was able to mold chakra instantaneously. Unlike even the most skilled shinobi who took at least a second to mold chakra after performing hand seals, Urashiki did it unconsciously. He had come to understand that during a battle, a shinobi wasted quite a bit of precious time performing hand seals or thinking about their next attack. If he could somehow make molding chakra for different jutsus and his taijutsu a natural instinct, he could certainly remove the limitation on his reflexes. Although, all of that was just a concept in his mind and Naruto wasn't even sure how to go around it. Moreover, until now he never really cared about using Kurama's chakra in a fight. And, he found his chakra coils to be highly strained after using it today against Urashiki. As he meditated, Naruto was also circulating a good amount of Kurama's chakra through his chakra coils to adapt to using Bija chakra. While he knew, he wouldn't need it in most scenarios, he did wish to have it mastered. Especially against unlikely enemies, such as the one he faced today. You felt that didn't you? Kurama asked. Naruto nodded as he had felt someone touch one of his chakra rods momentarily. Yeah, I did. And it was defiantly a shinobi. Naruto replied. Are you going to go and check? I don't wish to fight right now. It's possible that it was a random shinobi working under Gato who had come to check the area. There's no need to worry about that. We need to finish this mission quickly and get back to Kanoha. Naruto thought. Unknown area. Did you get it? Asked a man. 
He had a tall figure and wore a simple white kimono with a hood covering his face. His gaze lingered at the vast expanse of stars and planets above him. A few hundred feet beside stood a humongous tree whose height knew no bounds. At the top of the tree was a bud which appeared to be in its dormant state. Certainly. Stated Yurashiki as he took out his hook which was surrounded by Naruto's chakra. The man absorbed the chakra through his palms and breathed a sigh of relief. We lost over half our people fighting Takashiki-sama alone. Even though the boy was born a human, he has strongly inherited the powers of Yatsutsuki. Even now, I can sense the dormant powers that lay within him. Kagaya and Naruto Atsutsuki need to perish for the survival of the branch family. How has the boy's powers grown, the man questioned. He's an impressive one, my lord. The Shinju's powers were scattered into nine-tailed beasts on earth by Hagoromo, Kagaya's child. And Naruto holds the most powerful of them all, the Kyubi no Kitsune. His ability to harness chakra is quite admirable too, but the boy can certainly grow a lot more. Although, he seems to have no clue about the true potential of his eyes. Yurashiki explained briefly. The man nodded on hearing about Naruto. There's a great deal of loss written in the boy's future. Very soon, the time will come when he'll awaken the powers to create and destroy. Keep an eye on the boy, Yurashiki. For Earth years from now, is when the boy's will, will be at its weakest. I shall then send Mamashiki, Kinshiki, and you to harness the boy's powers. The man stated as he closed his eyes. Yurashiki bowed gratefully before his king as he slowly disappeared. If you like this content, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you later, bye bye.